another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross, licensed agent with Second City Real Estate. With me as always, man, just glaring at me at the Zoom today, Mark Anley, owner and founder of GC Realty. Mark, you it looks like you're dying to say something. No, I, I always glare at you because I try to like get you throw off your game and you're doing the introduction. So I'm, I was you did to, there. That was a bad one. I almost wanted to yell cut, but I'm not doing it. It's Friday. I know. I, know that was, I, I was waiting for you to yell cut. So I'm, I'm proud of you. You just rolled with it. That, that's that's about <laughs> that's that's experience right there of, of podcasting. And so you just learn how to roll with your mistakes and try and not to talk about it like I'm doing right now. So, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's Friday. I'm I'm pretty excited about today's episode. Um, but uh, you, you know, recently we had episode 181 where I worked with Matt Lacoste as his buyer's broker. And, and I do that from time to time. I don't necessarily, I just kind of pick and choose opportunities that that I might add the most value to. But, you know, you and me were talking earlier this week about uh, you working with buyers in like in Portage and Jeff Park and stuff like that. Like, are you doing any of that in 2023? Yes, yeah, still moving ahead there. You know, I, I'm with, with Bree Schmidt at Second City and, you know, if it's in my neck of the woods, if you're looking on the north and northwest side, more than happy to help. If you're looking in, you know, call it Pilsen or some of these other neighborhoods, I, I'll definitely refer you to someone that I think would be a great fit. But when it's in my backyard, like I'm already there, already walking properties all day. So yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's the right move. That's the right amount of velocity for me. Yeah. So uh, any listeners, anybody that, uh, if you are looking on that Northwest side, people do it to me all the time. They just reach out and ask questions and, and I point them in the right direction or I help them if I can. So anything on the North or Northwest on the Northwest side for Tom, if you're looking over there, you're interested in looking over there, you want to know the opportunity over there, reach out uh, to Tom. You could do it on uh, his email on the website, or you could reach out to straight up Chicago investor uh, at gmail.com. You know, obviously you're going to get the biased point of view though, born and raised over here. <laughs> or, yeah, it's the greatest, it. the greatest part, and it's the greatest part of America, Portage Park, <laughs> and no crime, nothing ever has happened ever <laughs> there over ever again. So yeah, so well, cool. What uh, what do we got for the housing provider tip of the week here? Yeah, so I was uh for the housing provider tip of the week. You know, we I overheard one of our assistant property managers talking to somebody today, and they handled the situation uh with a tenant. A tenant was pretty upset about something that we had no control over, and we weren't going to be able to do anything with. <laughs> like it was just like one of those scenarios. I, I forget the exact circumstance, but there was no way we were going to solve this person's problem. But um, we dissected kind of the conversation afterwards, and, and it really broke down to the assistant property manager just being able to acknowledge their pain point, their frustration, their anger, and how, and steps we could do to help uh, reduce that. We couldn't. That we were very upfront saying, "Listen, we can't solve your problem." And we could do this though. And they didn't use the word but word, but we can do this. It was, and we could do this. So just kind of providing that empathy in the way you approach uh, residents, uh, even when it, when it may not be your fault or your problem, the situation happened that they're upset or it might not be something you could solve, even if it is something that uh, that's caused by you or, or, or your owner or whatnot. It, it's just that, that empathy piece or, or letting them know that you hear them is going to go a long way. And that's kind of building that rapport and that that trust and, and like that you, you want to have with your residents to just kind of have a smoother relationship. So, yeah, it, I'll just piggyback there. I think in those situations, silence is deadly, right? Even if you don't have an answer, just pick up the phone and call, right? Just say, hey, I, I, we effed up, whatever it is, like, just, just own up to it. Like the, the, the silent, even if you feel bad, no one knows how you're feeling. No one knows your intentions. Just pick up the phone and call, let them know you, you know, whatever the situation, just deal with that uncomfortable conversation. Yep. Yep. Sometimes they just want to be heard. So, so, all right, good one. All right. We, we're excited. We're going to talk about some actual deals today. So our, our guest today uh, spent the past seven years in the corporate world working in the mergers, mergers and acquisition space as a strategy manager for large-scale corporations. She originally moved from Dallas. Or she, I'm sorry. She's originally from Dallas, moved up to Chicago two years ago specifically for our real estate market. So we had someone coming for, you know, all the bad press. Here we have someone who's actually coming specifically because of our market. Since then, in the last 13 months, she's bought 13 units. Uh, she's going to share success stories and also some struggles that others can learn from. So without further ado, Victoria Barkate, welcome to the show. Victoria, how are we Thank doing today? You. Good. I'm excited. I'm nervous and excited. So it's good. We, we are excited to have you. We'll have some good nervous energy here. So <laughs> l- let's start with, you know, you're from Dallas. Why Chicago? Why, why are we the lucky ones to have you say, you know what, I'm going to move yeah. here? 
Yeah, about two years ago, I knew I wanted to get into real estate and I knew that the path for me was the house hacking path. I was, I had no prior experience. The one in my family had prior experience. Um, so I looked up, I Googled what has the most, where, what areas of the United States, United States have the most two to four units. Um, and I think Chicago was the first or second. Um, and then it also went further into analysis and saw 30% of the housing market was two to four units. And so for me, I was like, that's awesome. That's my competitive advantage. So that's what I went after. Um, and I moved here without knowing anyone. Um, I was just having my life whenever I felt like I could. So it was good. And then I started listening to you guys and, you know, took off. Whew. We're, we're awesome. glad to be a part of that journey. So wait, let's, let's yeah. talk about this though. Like you, be, you move here without even buying the first house though, right? Just like I'm picking up oh, and I'm doing yeah. this. Like, let's, let's right. talk about this, the emotions. Yeah. Like what did your parents say? Right. Like there's, it oh, sounds, yeah. it sounds yeah. so great. It worked out, but like at the time, probably a lot of naysayers. Definitely. Um, my family actually had past, they had past failures in real estate. So they were really kind of against it. Um, but I had worked with someone who recently also moved to Chicago. Uh, he was someone I worked with. He was a coworker, and he was interested in real estate. Had no experience either. He's an engineer. I'm a consultant. Like we just, we have no idea what we're doing, but it was good because we both had money. And so we, uh, we had money saved up specifically for this. So that's what, that's what made it less scary. I think is that I knew someone else was in it with me. Um, to kind of go along the ride. So. What? So you said your family had some past failures and you don't have to dive into the specifics, but what was it that you saw in yourself that you knew, like, I'm not going to let that, uh, Happen shape, yeah, that, I'm not gonna like, let that shape my future. Like how'd you, how'd you look at that and, and kind of overcome that, that thought? Yeah. Um, they invested in single family. Um, and I knew that like my, my thing that from my mind was just, I need to get, I need to be able to save money on rent. I was paying like two grand a month on rent. Um, and I just, I knew that if I did that, I would save $24,000 a year. It'd be, that's a lot. Um, so that strategy, I think is much different than their experience with evictions, with having the property actually fall. They invested in 2008. Um, so it's, there's a lot of things that I just think didn't really uh, measure over. So, yeah. I am a huge Alex Hermosi fan. I don't know, Tom, if you, if you're on his YouTube, but uh, he, I watched one of his shorts yesterday and it was, uh, it, the, it's so simple. Like, he's like, if you save $1,500 a month for 30 years, you'll be in the one percenters. Like the, the, um, it was just like a, like, I'm like, oh, wow. Like it was anyone that doesn't follow Alex Hermosi needs to, he, he's just awesome. He's got just such great knowledge drop all the time. Good stuff. All right. So we have 77 designated communities here. How, like, you know, coming to Chicago, like, where did you have an idea of where you wanted to focus? Like, let's talk about landing here. And, and well, how'd you even there. know where to rent? I guess, like, let's hear that, that mindset, even. <sighs> that was hard. Um, it just, I like, I visited the, the, so when I came to visit, um, a friend of mine, the guy that had moved here, the, the co-worker of mine that she showed me around to different apartments to rent. Um, he showed me because he had just moved a month ago. Um, and so he showed me Wicker Park. He showed me West Loop, you know, all the like the standard places that consultants would go and move. Um, and I just fell in love with Wicker Park. And I was like, OK, this is where I'm going to buy because this is just easier for me to figure out one spot um, and just kind of dive in from there. So you just kind of got to go with it. OK. So, yeah. so we get here and then uh, if I'm not mistaken, the first property you buy, it's the four unit in Humboldt Park that we had spoken on before. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, that's right. Um, All right. So, yeah. so talk to us there. Like, how did you start looking? What did you make offers on other places? Like just getting that ball rolling for someone who may be in yeah. the same shoes that you were in. Right. So this was, this was last year, like around January timeframe, 2021, I believe January, February. Um, and so prices, like the market back then was like, the rates were so low. Um, so prices were jacked up. This was like the best time for prices to go up. And so we were, um, we were looking at a lot of four units um, in Wicker Park area. Um, and we put an offer on uh, one of them. It was pretty high. It was a pretty high, but, it, but with the rate, it just made sense with, um, with the property. It was a turnkey property. And that's what we decided we wanted to go after. It was turnkey because, again, we don't know what we're doing. Um, and we wanted to have something that was a little bit more safe. Um, so we went with a 20% conventional loan um, on that property. And that was before I knew 
other loan options that we utilize later on our other properties. Um, but that's that's how we found that one. It was just tip, it was just on Redfin. It wasn't anything special, no special strategy there. Um, okay. That's what we thought. Yeah. All right. So so you buy you said it's basically turnkey. What any struggles? Anything going through this yes. where it's like, so, ooh. Yeah. So t- so it's turnkey. Um what we did is we ended up raising all the rents by three hundred dollars. The rents were low, and surprisingly, all the tenants stayed. So um, that was that was a big surprise to me at the time. How, how did that message get delivered? <laughs> that, I mean, that's, that's a, a big surprise. bomb, right? Even if they're way under, <laughs> like that's that's a big. That's bomb. a big. For me, I would have left. I don't like. I still am surprised. The message was delivered over the phone. Um, I was super nervous doing it. I was like, you don't have to decide now you can, you know, you can think about it, look around in the market, let me know what you think. And immediately on the phone, all of them were like, no, we'll stay. I think they knew it was very much under market. Um, so, uh, so and it, it, yeah, I, I like the fact that you called because uh, you know, along the lines of, uh, the communication message that we talked about in the tip, like there, there's value in, in hearing your voice behind it. Cause I'm sure you went into it with some sure. sincerity and you weren't just like, I don't know. I, I think that that's important that you called and you just didn't trap up a text or, or send an email or deliver a letter on the front door. So that had yeah. to go a long way. Yeah. I think that helps a lot. And we have great relationships with them. They're all still there except for the one that I moved into. Um, there's, we let someone else moved in, but yeah, it, they've been great. Um, I think that did help. Um, all right. Yeah. So, so the first one, I mean, I, I could see why you get addicted here, right? You move in all of a sudden your rents are, you know, $900 a month more than what was provided, like without, without doing any rehab. It just went up two, two, two percent on the cap rate. Like, overnight. yeah, the real like, estate <laughs> is real estate. You got a 3% loan or 3% interest rate. Like, yeah, this, this real estate thing's great. <laughs> right. Right. It was nice. I remember whenever I sent out, whenever I was doing the underwriting, I was so nervous about not getting those rents. I sent it to five different investors that I was friends with, one being Tom, and none of them gave me a firm answer on whether or not I should go forward with it. Um, Everyone kind of, I don't think anyone wanted to tear me away because the price was higher than I think you normally pay for it. Um, But it just made sense with the rate. Like, again, like the numbers just made sense. And I'm glad that we did go with it. It just, it was a, it was a good first learning experience. Something that I think is a quick win, you know, on your first deal, you want it to be you want it to be check mark. Any hiccups on that lending side of things? I mean, you had um, a conventional loan that that's easier. Uh, you probably, you have a W2, uh, so that was easier. Anything surprisingly mm-hmm. there that, that you had to go through any hoops that you weren't expecting? Nothing with the lending side. What happened was when I, when I first, so when we first got the property, like one month in, um, there was a water heater issue. And this is something we didn't have anyone that we knew that could help um, no, like no contractors, uh, no, no references built up. So we ended up calling rotor rooter, which charged me like three times what I would normally, what you would normally pay. Right. Like I just called some, the first one who would come over overnight. And, um, that was a huge mistake. I think our, a lot of the first fixes, if I would have had the guys I have now, I would have saved at least 10 K. I mean, seriously, I, I way overpaid <laughs> for those services. So that was a huge, a huge miss. I should have I should have, you know, put my neck out there and asked, um, asked other investors who they use instead of being afraid to, you know, get references. So, yeah, yeah that was a big uh, one experience. Yeah. It, it, and we, a couple a couple things to pull out there. One, the networking piece that you mentioned, not being afraid to ask. You never know what someone's going to say, you know, hey, do you have someone for me? You never know what they're going to say or if they're going to give you their guy unless you ask. So you're mm-hmm. going to be in that situation. Um, and also just doing it proactively before something breaks, right? Like right. Add, just at a network event, you're talking to someone like, Hey, who's your boiler guy? <laughs> right. Exactly. Cause you don't want to, you don't want to be texting people on, you know, January 15th and when it's two degrees and it's 9 PM and you know, that's not the right time to be figuring out who you're going to go to. And that's the situation I was in. <laughs> you're right. I, yeah. Exactly. And, and so I, another, and just another important thing to pull out from the beginning, the beginning of the, the answer there is, you know, you went in this with realistic expectations. Right. It's not like, all right, I'm going to buy a four unit. I'm going to burr this thing. I'm going to pull out all my money in the next four months. Like I'm going to, you know, I want, I, right. I feel too many times, like we hear all these success stories and everyone's got their eyes on the trophy, right? They had this, this perfect deal and it doesn't come. And so they don't get started, right? This is a good deal. This isn't the A plus home run I'm getting all, but this is a good deal. And it, exactly. it's not only good. You, you look back at a year, mm-hmm. a couple of years from now, that like, wow, I'm glad I have this building. And on top of that, you're in the game now, right? All, you know, you're able to grow from it's from step one. 
Well, well, think about the people that wish they would have uh, paid a little more or did pass on that property and get that three and a half percent loan or that three percent loan that that can't get that now. Like that, that, that it's it's funny. The interest rate is the the what everyone's kicking themselves in the butt for, not the the overpaying or underpaying right now. Right. Yeah, and there's some properties now that I look at. I'm like, oh, I wish I would have bought those properties because I was I didn't I was too conservative to understand that it was a good deal or like a decent enough deal to make it make sense. Like there's so many times whenever I, I look back at that too. Um, I can't drive through the city without having that feeling. So that's something really? as a real estate investor. You, you, you always, you, you always like, ah, I wish I would have bought that's that good. one. That's good. But then there's always a feeling like, thank God I didn't buy that building. So that's those true. actually are, are way better feelings. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very true. All right. Very so, true. so what's the next building? Okay. So um, this next one. So I think it's the, what's interesting about this one is the way I found it. So I'm running out of cash at this point. I know I can't purchase the same size building I had last time and I have to do it with a different type of loan. Um, I was introduced to some lenders who had a 5% conventional with a seven-year arm, 10% conventional with a seven-year arm, no PMI. Um, and that's what that's the kind of loan that I needed to keep be able to grow. And of course, remember, I still have a partner in all this. Um, so I was trying to find off-market properties. So I saved up all my PTO for that year. And in December of last year, I took a month off um, and I set up a method to find off-market properties. So what I did is I used a prop stream to find my to find my list of properties. And then I used, I hired someone on Fiverr to go do um, what's it called? When you like find the number and you find uh, skip, skip trace. tracing. Yes, skip tracing. So that's how I got my skip tracing. And then I went and used launch control, with this, which is like a mass text messaging type of service. And I would text message these specific specific zip codes at a time that for properties that were three to four units specifically. Um, and I would come at them with like a, I would tell them, you know, hey, I'm a landlord. I'm on the cross streets of this and this. We just had this building. We want to grow a portfolio. I'd like a chance to talk to you. If not, you know, it's just great to meet another landlord in the area. I like to keep my ear to the ground. Um, kind of thing. So I had actually really decent results with that. I had about, um, to give you numbers on this, about 30% of the text messages, people responded. And of that percent, about 40% of them were positive. And when I mean positive, I mean like, it wasn't like a harsh no. It wasn't like a, you know, F off. So that was positive to me. <laughs> um, uh, and I actually went out and spoke to some of the folks that I, that I got positive responses from and gave them offers. One of them, and this leads to my next one, one of them, um, the guy was already selling his portfolio. He had like 55 units and he sent me the link to it on Lupta. And it was like 55 units. It was like, it was almost being sold as like a commercial property. And I could not tell from the listing that there was several four units in there. And I think that was huge. I was like, okay, bingo. This is <laughs> might be a competitive advantage for me. And it was um, one of his four units. I and the numbers worked out on. Um, this was a modernization, so we just had to modernize like the bathroom and the um, kitchen. So um, it was a legal three unit, or sorry, it was a three unit with an illegal fourth attic unit that we ended up turning into an attic. Yeah. Oh, before we go any further, you literally yeah. banked your PTO and you plan yeah. to take an entire month off so you can focus on real estate investing. Like, I yes. just want to take a yeah. second and, and listen to that 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 forethought, that planning. Like, <laughs> oh man, stop making excuses, everyone. <laughs> like that that is that is like awesome. Like, I, I don't know, that, that's so cool. I actually told everyone at work that I was going to um, like Thailand because I was afraid they would like they would judge me for it. You know, like oh, she's trying to get out of this job. You know, <laughs> that just sounds so bad, but yeah, I think that helped so much. Like, I, I don't think I would have been able to find the property without that. Cause it took so much effort just to get to the point to find the off market properties. Um, and then once I went back to work, I still hadn't found it yet. I had to keep on doing it, but it was I already had my process set up. So it was so much easier. It was just so much easier. Yeah. So the, the tech, the mass text, the, uh, um, you, you did that all Wicker Park. You, you stayed in the same neighborhood, correct? Wicker Park, Avondale, where else? I like it. Um, yeah, I think I started in Wicker Park and Avondale, and then one of, uh, like one of the spot. I can't. I can't remember. I were think you in Humboldt and Logan or no? Um, yes, actually, yes, Humboldt and Logan. Yes, but it was like, uh, yeah, it was like. Well, I would. There is some part of six oh six two two that is Humboldt, but that was that was the area I stayed in. The east side of the park over there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. So, how did you know to do this? Off, like, wh wh where did you gather information? Right. A lot of people might be saying, "Hey, I got the, I got the grit. I'm going to go through with that, but I don't know how to get started." 
Like, is this just going on bigger pockets, talking to people? Like, how do you find out like, all right, I got to get props in. I got to do this because it's not rocket science, but there's also no manual out there. Right. Um, there's a lot of free education on YouTube. I mean, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of people that do this professionally, like as their day job and get paid to do this. Um, so I just, and there's a lot of free content and that's how I did it. Just look up on YouTube, like how to find off market properties. And I dived into like a, a little rabbit hole on that. I just did a lot of research on it. And the systems I used were recommended by people that have been doing it for a long time. So didn't really pay for anything, just researched. It's readily that's available. Awesome. Yeah. All right. It, so it worked, we, yeah. we get rewarded for our efforts. We end up with another four unit here. Mm -hmm. Now talk to us a little about because this happens a lot in Chicago, you're buying, you know, there's four units it's zoned, you know, the zoning service is going to show a three. Did you have issues with the lender? Like just talk about actually getting that across the finish line. Yeah. So that was, um, we did a 10% conventional on that loan. Um, I don't, there wasn't really issues getting it across the finish line. It came in as a, 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 a three unit with an Ill, a, illegal, um, fourth unit. Right. And I was okay with that. Um, I wouldn't say there was issues there. What, what ended up happening is literally like a couple weeks later, another property came up that was a really great deal, right? Like they all just seem like such great deals whenever you're, you know, um, hustling like that. And um, I decided, okay, we're going to underwrite it. I'm going to go and underwrite this property as well. So I also like a within the same month time span had closed on two properties, two, four units, sorry, one, three unit with a legal fourth, but, and then one, four unit um, with an illegal fifth unit. So um those both happened at the same time, both 10% down loans. One was under my name, one was under my partner's name. And we used, you know, a joint venture, a handshake agreement to agree, you know, we're going to split this like we always do. Um, and, and that's how we got there. But the, the biggest struggles happened during the renovation because both of these needed renovations. So we were renovating eight units at the same time for the first time ever. So that was, that was tough. All right. So back up, back up. So you got yeah. these, these eight units. Um, so it's, were they, when you bought them, were they all empty? Were they, were they, they, they full? To tell us a little bit about the building. You said they need a rehab. What would what, what, you plan for versus kind of what you, you end up doing? Talk a little yes. bit about that. Okay. So for the three unit with an illegal four, um, we offered a lot of the tenants, we needed them to move out. They were, it was all full. So we offered the tenants cash for keys. Um, if they, if they didn't want to move out, earlier. Um, and that worked out. I think we like, we offered $700 was the max that we had to offer for cash for keys. Um, because we wanted them to get rented out in the summer. Remember I bought it in the winter. Um, and that didn't, didn't like our schedule went way past summer for one of our, for one of our properties, but, um, Push, push back on the cash for keys, like $700. They said, yeah, we'll take it. Like, I mean, some this people, way too easy. <laughs> no, that's what's crazy is like they, uh, some people said, yeah, we'll take it. I think I started at 500 and then some people said, no, no way we're not moving. And I just made plans to let them stay. And then they came back asking for more when they realized, oh, like there's, they, I guess they found other units and then they're searching that actually was a better price, something like that. Um, so it, it wasn't, it wasn't, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't too hard surprisingly they were good tenants so it wasn't hard to push them out because they were paying and everything so um yeah that's your question so, so the rehab so the first four flat there uh, with the non-conforming legal unit uh, what, what you you had it underwrite it going into it with a rehab budget like how much yes. are you planning on how much were you planning on doing with that that's a good question so this was our first ever rehab um plan on thirty thousand dollars for the modernization um of all the units and one of the units we even gutted and that was you know we had to pull in some family friends to help us with that one <laughs> that one was a tight one but um it made us a lot more confident going into the to the second property um with the rehab we had already had all our contractors set up we had all our um you know our relationships so it was a lot so we have kind of like a standard look that we have everything go through in, so thirty thousand dollars is not a lot. Like I know, I, I know. know. Like so, like I, know. I mean, you had to have a lot of family and friends and, and your own kind of sweat equity in there. Like, <laughs> I, well, like it was. I think so. It was my job to figure out how to renovate the bathrooms, and then uh, my partner's job to do the kitchens. And he did it with his stepdad. Um, so a lot of help. He just come over to our house and then help us. He lives in like Ohio, so um, he drove over here. So that was that was really helpful. What, what did you learn about that experience? Like, I think when you're, when you're in there trying to figure out how to do things on like 
listen, that that's, that's shoestring. <laughs> like, it, like, like, what did you learn about yeah. like, just the, the uh, rehab business, I guess, and going through that? Well, I will say like, I, before we bought the properties, I hired two, two contractors to come take a look at it. So they like, they did a walkthrough and I would write down everything they were saying that would need to get that, like at the price for everything. And I would send it to them afterwards, ask them if they would change anything on it. So I got that rehab budget from them actually. Um, and I'm not doing like crazy stuff. Like it's, again, it's just like replacing, like, I'm not replacing the, I'm not replacing the, um, like the cabinets. I'm just, you know, doing, you know, a new granite, um, stuff like that, new flooring, um, which my partner put a lot of sweat equity into. Um, so a lot, a huge learning process. And we got mad at each other quite often during that process. (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was not a fun summer for me. I'll say that. So the whole time those four units were empty then as you're trying to do this work on that, that first building? What was that? The all, all four units were empty while you're doing this. So were you doing it all the units what? at one time? Yeah. So three of the units were, I was doing at one time for this first building. And the one of, one of the tenants stayed, um, was in the bottom unit. We had them keep paying. So that, that helped out with our holding costs. It helped yeah. out. Did they complain at all during construction? Were they cool or like? This tenant was really cool. And we also like decreased her rent a little bit. Okay. because she was so cool about it and she still like keeps an eye on everything like we live next to like section eight housing and there's a lot of issues over there too so she always she always helps us um it's, it's like so imp- i can't even like the amount of times like my tenants having a good relationship with my tenants have come through for me in different situations like like yeah it, it's 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 been helpful so i'd say having good relationship with your tenants um one other thing i did learn that I always say something that I messed up on too when I first um, got into this was I had a tenant that they, we asked them to move out, right? The cash for keys. And I was supposed to give them a security deposit back within I think 45 days is the requirement on the RLTO. I have forgot to give it back to them. I, I just, I, I completely forgot. And it was like day 60 and they messaged me saying, hey, because you know, you, you forgot to give it back to us or you, you forgot to give back the social security deposit, the security deposit, I think, you have to give them like one month's rent or something like that. That's like the fee for it. And they knew that. And they messaged me and they said, Hey, because, because you were nice to us, we just want the security deposit. And I was like, yeah, of course, you know, so they could have got me there. Um, so that was really, really nice. Three times plus attorney fees. If you end up in court with something like that. Really? So so very, uh, (laughs) your report dodged a bullet there. So that's seriously did. Yeah. They could have gotten that. Yeah. Talk to us about the other four flat. You, you cleared that one to catch your keys. You got, you got them all out. You got uh same, similar type of rehab. Tell me about that. Um, so this one was a little bit different of a rehab. I'm trying to remember if there were, yeah, there were tenants in all of the units. Um, and uh, we didn't actually do cash for keys for this one. We just, uh, their, their rental renewal dates were happened to be the, around, around the same time that we needed them to be out anyways for the renovations. So it ended up working out um, really well. Uh, we have still kept one tenant in while we're doing the renovations. And this one tenant, again, came to help me in times when I needed him. Um, again, just being good to your tenants, helping them out. And I can explain more about that in a second. Yeah, so let's go there. I guess, I guess before going there, one thing that you mentioned that I want to pull out is, you know, being, having arguments with your partner, right? I, I think that's, you know, maybe I view the world differently, but, you know, I think that's healthy, right? The, I, and I don't remember the, my Mark, you might have been the one who told me the quote, but it's the, 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 uh, the lack of conflict is not healthy. harmony. It's apathy. Yeah. Right. Like you, it shows you, you, you need that, right. If, in order to push forward, like you need a little bit of back and forth and you shouldn't take it as, I don't know, we're this culture that's like so scared of conflict and like, no, it's, it's okay. It's healthy. It's how you grow. Yeah. In the business right. world, uh, Peter Lencioni, uh, healthy conflict is, is what they talk about to continue to challenge each other. Um, and it's all about doing it professionally and respectfully. Of course, you can't punch people because right. you don't get your way. But uh, yeah, no. No, it's all about healthy conflict. Yeah. Good. That's all good. right. So I know we talked a while back. You have a tenant horror story. So let's let's jump in because I think this is where the other tenant helped you out. Correct? Yeah. Big all time. Right, so let's, let's hear the <laughs> horror story here. Okay. Um. So renovated all of the units I'm house hacking this last unit uh, or this, this last property here. Um, so renovated all of them, except for the one that I'm in. Um, and so, uh, we rented it out to this nice lady. She had a great background. Um, you know, credit history was great. References were great. I talked to them on the phone. They sound legitimate, like no past anything. She was great. Um, and then I met her 
or one thing that that was really weird that caught me off guard was that she didn't want to she didn't want to she she paid the deposit without looking at the unit she just wanted to see a video tour and that was it which is normal for people that are coming from out of town I've actually had a few tenants that come out of town that just want the same thing um but so nothing really raised a red flag for me um at least at that point. Now it, my, my process has changed, so it's a little bit different. But um, um, whenever I met her on the day that she moved in to pick up her keys, she said that she was 27 in her, her application, but she was actually 57 when I met her. So I was like, this is a little <laughs> bit off, but I don't, I don't want to judge, right? So just like let that go. Um, and then she didn't pay first month's rent. Um, she became very hostile. Um, like just like texting why she was just very very rude when I would message her and I would try to talk to her and call her she didn't want to take my calls anymore like she flipped into a different person it's like I don't even know who you are people were coming over and this is this is like I'm, I'm like right next door so I was able to see a lot of it people were coming over that I'd never seen before um and I found out why later but um something just was like fishy about it when I would talk to my lawyers they say oh you have to go through the eviction process that kind of special thing um but I looked into her records and I started Googling like the company she said that she worked for, where she got her pay stubs from. Um, and it hadn't been around for like the past three years. So that was false. And then I also looked into the mail and, and saw some of her mail that she would get to the house. Um, and it was a different person on, on all of it. And then I realized this is not the person that I thought it was. This is not the person that applied. Um, so I quickly, you know, did some, sent to my lawyers and um, they found that she has multiple evictions. Um, you know, just, I, I didn't even know it was possible to have multiple evictions at the same time, but she um, was definitely, she stole someone's identity and she, it, you know, the way that she did it would sound, it was just very professional. Um, yeah, I'll stop there because I know I feel like I'm rambling. Well, no, that that's that's a big problem. And I, I I will link to it in the show notes. I wrote an article on this for Bigger Pockets a couple months ago. Like this, she didn't steal it; she bought it from somebody. She went online, she paid five seven hundred dollars, and and yep. she got an entire profile, stubs, uh, uh, a license, <sighs> everything, and then they go in. So the and it's always like that. It's it's one of those uh, too good to be true scenarios. So like perfect credit, no background, uh, like. The, 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 you, in hindsight, you see like some of the flaws, like, oh man, like, but the, 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 the front and this is important for everybody. Let's do it. The front is, it, it makes it look so good and they're so sweet and they're so nice. And, uh, it ends up, uh, uh, not being them and they just take possession. And then you have to, uh, you have to then go through the process and some of them actually do pay and buy it and, and they're trying to be legitimate tenants, but they're just so messed up that they couldn't ever get approved themselves. So a lot of those will crumble after seven, eight months. They might, some of them go in with a tent to never pay again and just try to get a year out of it. But then a lot of them are going in to, uh, try just cause they can't. And, and then they end up, you know, eventually, uh, uh, a needle breaks the back and, and they, they can't make payments and they turn into that tenant then as well. So yeah. it's, it's a crazy problem right now. We actually just upgrade our screening stuff or mm-hmm. criteria to be able to scan the documents, uh, to see like the bank statements. Cause even the bank statements, like we scanned a, a fake bank America one versus a real one. And it's crazy. Just the little things that, that, that anyone just looking would never, never think twice. Right. Oh, yeah. that's insane. Just a Jeff Weinberg tip here. I know like with everyone that he screens, whether it's a reference or whatever, he'll be a little off with the information to see if they say anything, right? Whether you're talking to the past housing provider or reference, like he'll intentionally feed them. Jeff, who's doing the screening, will intentionally feed them the wrong information to see if they correct them or not. If they don't yes. correct them, then it's like, wait a minute. Like they're just, they're saying yes to whatever I'm going to say here. And then like you get more exaggerated with it to see if they just keep saying yes and be like, all right, this is this is fishy here. Right. Yeah. And that's what I should have done because all of her references I talked to were her friends. They would just, they like knew what to do. <laughs> well, the and funny thing is with all those, whenever I talk to people that have those, and we've had a couple of them at GC, when you call those reference numbers back two, three, four months later, they don't exist. Nothing works anymore. Um, so like, those are all kind of like short term, like uh, uh, Bumber type numbers that, uh, that are out there for solely for that deal. Yeah. Well, like what got really, what got really messy about this was not only was she not who she said that she was, she stole someone else's identity, but she was also, she also had another fake identity that I found out about too. Cause I would get calls after the listing came down and everything, everything um, from tenants that were like, Hey, I'm supposed to move in this month. I don't have any information. And I'm like, 
who, who did you talk to? And she was showing the unit, pretending like she and her husband owned the property, owned the building. So she had the keys and she was able to show it as an empty unit. Like there wasn't a lot of stuff she kept in there. So she was able to show it as an empty unit and um, got a couple people on the tenant side scammed as well because they paid uh, deposits as well to get the property. So it was, left me with a lot of work there as well. Very, right, how do we get out of this? Yeah. <laughs> what um, are the steps? <laughs> Yes. Okay. So this is something that one of my lawyers, he mentioned to me, he said, you know, it sounds like with her not really being there, it sounds like, like in a, an abandonment situation. And there is a section in the RLTO that's for abandonment where it says, you know, if the tenant has not been there within 32 days, um, has not been on the premises, has not said that they, has not um, responded to you or said any, or um, I forget like the exact wording. It's like, at 32 days, if they haven't responded to you um, and they have no intent of paying or staying um, written, then you can cause for abandonment. And that's the method that we decided to go with um, because that just, it just, it, it was technically true. She was not the person that was on the lease. So she hadn't really been there. And um, the, there is a risk to that. And my lawyer mentioned, you know, there is a risk. You have to be okay to take that risk. At this point in time, I was okay with the risk, um, the legal fees that would come up if she ever wanted to, you know, file a lawsuit, um, you know, good luck because you're going to have to file as someone that you're not. But um, I was okay with that at this point. So um, she, we sent the notice to her um, and I put up cameras so I can find out when she's there and when she's not there. And then there was like a moment in time when I knew she wouldn't be there. I went to my tenant that's above her, the one that I'm friends with. And he helped me move out all of her, all of everything that she had in there. Um, we locked the doors, um, changed the keys. And um, by the time she came back, I had written the notice, all the notice for abandonment. And then I also written another notice for, you know, you know, falsifying, you know, her records and committing, you know, class two identity theft, stuff like that. Um, so she was not happy. I have the recordings of it. She was throwing everything around. <laughs> was bad. So she came back. What did she do? Like, she, she call you she, screaming? Uh, no, she didn't even try and call me. Like, even she, uh, she stopped talking to me. She just wouldn't oh, talk so to me. So you saw it on the cameras. Yeah, that's how I, that's how I knew she left, and she tried to sneak into the windows. But luckily, um, my partner suggested to put up like the window blockers, you know, like the just the, I don't know what they're called, like the sticks that hold it. Um, but she tried to get in through the windows, and luckily we had that. Um, yeah, she was she was not happy. And she didn't even take half of her stuff with her. She just left, and like she had a lot of nice stuff there. I had a lot of scavengers come by and actually take most of it. She never came back. It was very odd. Well, that's good. I'm I'm happy uh, happy that worked out with not having further complications like you could have with those risks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's you know, man. It, yeah, those sleepless nights. A year later, it's a funny story, right? It's, it was like <laughs> it's I'm a, telling you though. Like yeah, like when you don't know who it is, it you you really do worry about it more than you should. Like it's not like a normal eviction. You, it's yeah. It was a lot of a lot of anxiety came out of that, but I'm glad that it's over for sure. So, all right. So we got that building humming along. We, we got past the tenant horror story. Yeah. What's next? Like, are you, are you still actively looking at buildings? If so, where, you know, where are you looking in Chicago? Yes. Um, so I'm still going to be, so for my, my next outlook in 2023, I definitely want to keep buying buildings. Um, still I'm, I'm planning on doing one building a year. Um, at this point, I'm also looking for other partners as well. I think for me, like the key is just to have, to have like partners will help you build. Um, I think that that's a, a huge key to my growth is just going to be able to have that. Um, I have another, <laughs> another great partner type of partner is like a, a veteran partner because they have great loan options. Um, so I have another partner that is, that we're um, talking about also, doing something where they can have like the, the VA loan, the 0% down loan while they're trying to get started. I'm helping them kind of transition to it. Um, just using all of my resources uh, with that. So that's also another growth option where you don't have to use a ton of money down, um, especially with high rates right now. It just makes a lot of sense. You have but, such great energy. Like where do you get this from? Where's your motivation come from? Like you didn't want to be a consultant when you were growing up. Like, what, 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 the, yeah. t- like where does this all come from? Um, my dream is to 
buy a business. So I, I love investing. I just like, it's, it's, I don't really like invest in stocks. I like investing long-term plays. So next year as well, like part of this, I want to buy a business, um, buy a company. I'm looking at property management companies in the Dallas and Austin area, um, just to kind of build on what I have going on right now while still be able to invest in Chicago. Um, so I, that's just my dream. And I just love it. It's very similar, very, very similar to buying a house. The process is very similar, just different type of investment strategy. Um, I know a property management business sale broker in Texas. If, if you want, I'll make an introduction. And he, of course, oh, yeah. So. I really would. That is awesome. Yes. I am, I'm doing the whole thing. I'm actually about to take off work in a couple of months because I'm about to do the thing where I just layer in my office. Thailand? <laughs> Back to exactly. Thailand. <laughs> Let's go to Thailand in a couple months. Back to Thailand. Buy 10 more units. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm saving up all my PTO and money. <laughs> so, so that's that's where I'm at next. What um you know, you've you've done a lot. Think about just how much you know now that you didn't know two years ago, right? Talk to our listeners a little about what did you do? Like, did you go to networking events? I mean, you I know you I know you said gracious words about the podcast, which we appreciate. What else? Mm-hmm. Like, what have you done besides besides the obvious jumping in and doing it? But what are some other things that you've done just to set yourself mm-hmm. up for success? Um, yeah, so I think it's mainly, I read, I would read a lot. I would listen like podcasts. I just, that's how I get most of my information is through podcasts. Um, I would also network a lot. I would go to all the networking events that they had here for real estate. Um, every single one of them I would go to and just meet people who are also doing it. Um, one other thing that I think was huge for me was I, 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 for my first three properties, I had, um, another investor friendly, a realtor that was able to guide me through a lot of it. So, I mean, I, I can't tell you the amount of value that they gave me because I would, I was able to leverage all their contacts for their past renovations, what they, what they did. Um, so that was so helpful than have rather than getting it on my own and finding it and learning from that. That was, that was huge. Um, just having like, almost like a, they were almost like a mentor, you know, <clears throat> that you paid. <laughs> all right. So who are the investment minor brokers you're working with? Give them a shout out here. Uh, John Westbrook um, and Michael Scanlon, who both were on one of your podcast episodes as well. I originally found Michael from um, Bigger Pockets, though. He's awesome. just a beast on Bigger Pockets. Got he has that blue check mark. <laughs> so yeah, him and Jake are big on there. It's huge. Yeah, they're, they're big. I, I've, I just a personal shout out. Like I've used both of them, both Mike and Jake and their team at EXP to sell off a lot of my south side property. So I've I'm also been a client of them. And then uh, John Westbrook works at the uh, Floor and Blonick team which I, we've used on a lot of our Greystone flips there. So you're in good hands. Go. Yeah. 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 They made it happen. So. All right, Tom, you ready to wrap? Let's do it. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. Question one, what is your competitive advantage? How have you been able to do this? All these units in such a short time, so much energy working a full-time job. How have you been able to do this while so many people wish they could? My partner's. It all comes down to the, my partners, realtors that help me, and um, the, the people, the other investors that have helped guide me through this. If I don't know something, I go and ask them, and they are so willing to help. So, yeah, having good partners. What is the one piece of advice you would tell someone that is yet to buy their first property here in Chicago? Um, use a investor, a, a, a realtor who has multiple investment properties in the type of investment property you're looking at and has had success with it. Uh, that's the biggest key for someone who hasn't done it before. It's like a best way to get a mentor. Right. Yeah. When you're not in Thailand, what do you do for fun? <laughs> uh, oh God. Um, I'm obsessed with buying businesses. That's it. That's what I do for fun. I mean, I truly love it. Like it's so it's, I hope to one day buy as many businesses as I buy real estate. Like that's, that's a true dream of mine. So born to do mergers and acquisitions. Wonderful. Born, I mean, that's like, it's, it's sad. That's like my (laughs) obsession. So if I'll talk to anyone about it for so long, if they, if they let me, so it's, it's a dangerous subject to get into. All right. What is a good book podcast or self-development activity that you'd recommend to our listeners? One book, if you're not financially financially as, as savvy as um, you'd like to be, one thing that really helped me was the Managing by the Numbers book. That was a huge help. It kind of explained how to under- analyze financial statements uh, really well. I feel a lot more confident. I used um, also Tom and Mark's 
house hacking calculator. And I still use that for all of my house hacks that I've, uh, that I've gone through with. So that was huge. And, um, ended up actually messaging Tom and Mark, uh, a nice, a nice note, um, a little bit of a clickbaity note. I think I said, um, <laughs> for me personally, it was, I was able to get 300 K in net worth, um, in the past year and a half. And, um, rent free with 3k and cash flow coming in each month in addition the so that bait. is the yeah. clickbait was i'm 300,000 richer from listening to your podcast so I, 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 messaged I, tom. I messaged tom i said we gotta make that the uh the, the title of this podcast episode like that's perfect that's awesome. and while we're talking about the calculator it's we'll link to it in the show notes a uh, huge shout out to alex ferrero he was the, the original one who helped put that thing together and we're yeah. still still providing a ton of value to people out there it really is. Yeah. I recommend it to everyone that, you know, is looking to do the same thing. So Awesome. Well, we appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Be- besides yourself, name one person in your local network that you'd highly recommend as a quality resource to other investors. Uh, so I'm going to give what I, I normally don't hear a lot of contractors or a lot of like plumbers or technicians uh, shout it out, but I'm going to shout out my plumber, Brandon um, Schnertz spelled S N R T Z. There's no vowels in his last name. It's very hard to pronounce. Like this guy already. Um, yeah. Yeah. He's great. He's like, he has, you know, every, every check box checked for this plumber. He's great. So he would have saved me a lot of money if I would have known him sooner. <laughs> That's great. Well, we'll find him and uh, link to him in the show notes. So awesome. Victoria, thank you so much. Uh, you provide a ton of insight, a ton of value to our listeners. How can they learn more about you? Is there any way they can provide value to you? Um. Uh, my, my Twitter that I tweet on, I tweet about real estate and I tweet about, um, business buying as well. Um, it's just at least my journey, just what I'm learning, uh, miss nine to five, miss, yeah, miss nine to five or miss five to nine on Twitter. Sorry. I messed that up, but it's, it's miss five to nine. <laughs> awesome. We'll, we'll link to that in the show notes. Okay. Sounds good. All right, Mark, we're doing a Chicago fact here. We are. We are. We're going to play for Dana Downing, who bought a hoodie out of Elgin. She bought a hoodie in August. So she was, it's pretty cool. She was preparing for winter that early. So. That is someone who's prepared. That's someone who does not need to read that financial freedom book. She's, yeah. she's got to act together. Yeah. All right. Multiple choice. I'll give you a shot and then Victoria will get a shot as well. Mark, who said this quote? Eventually, Chicago will be the most beautiful great city left in the world. And your options are Franklin Lloyd Wright. Mark Twain, Barack Obama, Jane Byrne. Eventually, Chicago will be the most beautiful, great city left in the world. I'm going to say uh, Mark Twain. That just sounds like something he would say. All right, Victoria. The last one, Jane. Jane Byrne. Mm-hmm. Oh, guys, Frank, Franklin Lloyd Wright. I, th- I didn't know he, he talked. It was too I, obvious I with the architecture. I've never heard a quote by him. Like his quotes are just like his buildings. Like, so I, I've never even like, I, I don't know much about him, I guess. That is a valid point. So I, I eliminated him right away. Just out of like, yeah, those were hard choices. <laughs> the middle two were okay. And, and Mark Twain's just known for like his sayings and his comments like over the years. So I thought for sure. So, all right. Um, well, I, I apologize, uh, Dana Downing. Uh, we will uh, put your name back in and get drawn again. You could uh, win. Buy a t-shirt for the spring. We'll do this again. Yes. And if we know you were good now that you're a planner, you'll buy it next month. So perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you, Dana, for a person checking out our merch store. Uh, you know, Victoria, thank you for coming on here. Tom, thank you as always. Listeners, um, go on onto our merch store, buy something and get your name put in for the Chicago fact, uh, prize that we do every podcast episode. You heard Victoria talk about the calculator, house hacking calculator here today. Go on there, check it out, download it. It's, it's, it's free. You could use it. It's, it's pretty, it's an awesome tool. Um, you got to check it out and run your numbers on there. Or if you have a friend that, you know, you can refer it to them as well to realtors. You could use it for your, your clients. So check that out. Uh, Victoria, thank you again for coming on Tom. Thank you as always. And listeners, we'll see you next week. Thanks all. Thank you.